My name is Christine Harrington, and I want to preface first that I am a Catholic. I was born a Catholic, and the reason why I want to preface with that is because it ties in with my near-death experience story. So knowing that I was uh, born a Catholic, I moved away from the church in the late 70s after my divorce. And to say that I lived pretty promiscuous life is a somewhat true and was not living, I'll just say I wasn't living life according to the Catholic Church. So I found myself pregnant. And this was in my early 30s when I found myself pregnant. And the father of the child said, get rid of it. And I had, at the time, my parents were not supportive at all. So I went through my first abortion. I'm telling you this for a reason. Then after I left him, a few years later, I found myself living with a man and uh, I was pregnant again and I had a second abortion. I know that there are many people out there that says abortions are okay, but in my belief system, they are not. I knew that I was killing a child and to say that it didn't bother me, it did. It bothered me greatly, although I acted like it didn't. I presented a, a good face to the world, but there was no one around me on either pregnancy that was remotely happy that I was having a baby and there was no support, no emotional support at all for having a baby, just a lot of pressure to abort. So shortly after that, the same father, the same man that I was living with, I got pregnant again. And this time I said, there is no way I'm going to abort. I don't care what I got to do. If it's to leave this relationship, to raise this child alone, I will do that. Well, that leads me to the time of delivery. It was a very difficult pregnancy and a very difficult delivery. 29 and a half hours of labor, the doctors decided that I was not going to be able to deliver this baby naturally. So my son was stuck in the birth canal. His heartbeat was getting fainter and fainter. My blood pressure was out of control. So they were very concerned that about my blood pressure and about losing my son. So they put me into an emergency C-section and I was being wheeled in by the anesthesiologist and nurse and he put me under. And at that point, I only saw the anesthesiologist. There was no one else in the room when I was put under. And the next thing I knew, I was floating above myself on the uh, ceiling of the surgery room. And I'm looking around and I knew it was me, but I was trying to connect. How am I seeing these doctors frantically working on me? And there were nurses coming in and out, rushing in and out. And these two doctors were frantically working on me. I had no idea what was going on, but I was stunned over the fact that I could see this going on. And I'm thinking, what's happening to me? Well, the minute I thought that is when everything went totally black, totally black. And I remember trying to see my hands, looking down to see if I could see my feet, and I couldn't see a thing. It was that black. I had never experienced darkness to that extent in my entire life, where you just couldn't see anything in front of you. 
or below you or around you at all. So you can imagine then at that point, I realized I must have been dead. And because of my Catholic upbringing and because I had had the two abortions, which I had never confessed, I thought that I was in hell or going to hell. So I couldn't feel my body, but I sensed my body, if that makes sense. And so this enormous fear and terror came across me and I cried out, God, please, please don't send me to hell, please. And then the next thing I knew, I saw this little teeny tiny light, like a pinpoint of a light. And I started moving towards the light. Now, I consciously moved towards the light. It. Some people I know have reported they were pulled to it. I consciously moved towards the light. And that was the thing that became just apparently abundant to me. Being on the other side is you are still yourself. You're, you've got your same personality. You've got your same thoughts, same fears. You're the same. The only difference is you don't have a body. So as I was moving towards this light, this comfort started just pouring over me, pouring over me. And the closer I got to the light, the less fear I had and the less terror I had. And I just started feeling more and more comfortable and more and more hopeful. And then I started feeling just this incredible love just coming through me. And so I'm the closer I got to the light, it went from like total blackness to dark gray to gray to light gray to the white light of God. And I knew it was God. I could sense it was God. And but but and this is what I've always struggled with is where was I really? Was I in purgatory? Because it didn't feel like God was letting me into heaven, although he gave me the grace and the blessing to feel his love, to feel his joy. And all of the guilt and the shame and the pain and the suffering and the agony just fell away, completely fell away. Being in God's presence, that white light that you can look up into, but you don't feel it stinging your eyes or hurting your eyes. I don't know if we even have eyes, but... <laughs> When you're looking up into that white light of God, all you can feel is love and joy. Nothing else. It was the most incredible love and joy I have ever felt in my life. There is no words to adequately describe what that feeling is. It is incredible and you'll never ever be able to have that feeling here on earth that is god's love and god's joy and the warmth just flowed through me his warmth just flowed through me it was the most amazing experience i've ever had in my entire life and i still try to hold on to that experience and it's hard. It's really, really hard. I don't know how long I was there. There were two beings with me, but I didn't see them. I only heard them through my thoughts, but I don't know who they were. I just don't know. And they told me that I was given a choice. I could stay or I could go back. And I asked them, well, if I stayed, what will happen to my son? 
and they said, oh, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. And that's all the information I got. And I just remember wrestling with it so, so much because believe me, everyone, when you experience what I experienced on the other side, you don't want to come back to this earth of pain and suffering. You don't want to come back to the physical constraints of this body. It's just when you're over on the other side, your whole being is expanded. You're expanded and the feelings are a thousand, a million times more strong than they are here on earth. And you don't have pain and suffering. Physical pain, emotional pain is gone. So I was really struggling with this. And I told them that I had to go back. They said, well, you have to make a decision. And I said, I have to go back. I can't leave my baby. And in the next moment, I remember waking up here. I thought I just delivered a baby. And my mother comes to my bed and said, oh, she's awake. She's awake. And then a nurse came in and uh, explained to me that I had been unconscious for four days that I had died, that my son had died too, and they were able to bring us both back. So it was four days after I delivered, had the emergency C-section. I don't know if I was in heaven for four days. I don't know. All I know is when I came back and I woke up, it felt like my spirit was trying to be squeezed into like a bottle. It was painful to have my spirit come back into my body. I felt physical pain. The nurse said that I shouldn't have felt pain because I was on some kind of drip, but it was physically painful to come back into my body. So four days had gone by. The next day, the neonatal surgeon came to me and said that my son had a 50, 50% chance of living. And did I want them to call a priest or a minister? Well, I'd been out of the Catholic church, so I didn't, didn't have a priest to give them to call, but a minister came and prayed with me. And I, I do believe my son was a miracle because after the minister prayed, I told God, I said, just save him. If you save him, I promise I will make sure that he knows you. And the next day, the neonatal surgeon said, they do not know what was, why this happened but my son was off life support now and that they think he was out of the woods. So I truly believe it went from 50-50 chance to 24 hours after praying to he's completely off the ventilator and we believe that he's out of the woods. And I do believe God, God saved him. You know, and in all reality, God didn't even need to save me. You know, I'm about as big of a sinner as anybody else. Although I try to live a very chaste life, I try to do what's good, I try to uh, follow God's will. And then afterwards, I left his father, so I'm now raising this child by myself. And as much as I wanted to explore my near-death experience, I couldn't because I was so strapped in survival mode trying to make a life for my son and I. And, you know, it was hard. I'm not going to lie. It was hard. And so all these years later, especially during COVID, when people were afraid of dying, I wasn't afraid of dying. If I got it, and which I did, 
I wasn't afraid of dying because I knew what the other side looked like and how much better it is on the other side. Now, I'm not saying I wanted to die, but I wasn't afraid to die. And one of the biggest things that I struggled with with the near-death experiences, I know that there are Catholic near-death experiencers that have said that, you know, um, the church lied to us and they're out of the Catholic church. I wasn't ready to throw the Catholic church under the bus. I was trying to reconcile what happened to me. Here I was, committed three mortal sins, two abortions and living with a man. And yet when I died, I didn't automatically go to hell. I cried out to God and asked for his help. Maybe that's the difference. But I didn't automatically go to hell like we're taught in the Catholic Church. So in my quest of trying to reconcile the near-death experience with Catholicism, I found a woman, her name is Sandra Abrahams. She's an 83-year-old woman, and she had her near-death experience back in the 70s. She's a Catholic, and but she had an experience with Jesus. I did not. My experience was only limited to seeing God in the white light, feeling God, and not even hearing God, just feeling God, feeling his love, feeling his joy. And in my mind, I was probably in purgatory. And that's fine. Hey, I'm willing to go to purgatory if that means that I get to heaven. But I was really trying to reconcile things. So I reached out to her and she was very gracious talking to me and she helped me reconcile the near-death experience with my faith. And I can't tell you how much comfort that brought to me and how helpful it was to me for my faith. So I love sharing my near-death experience stories because I want to be a story of hope. You have no idea how beautiful it is on the other side. Life doesn't end on this earth. You go on forever and ever, which is why I created my own YouTube channel, The Eternal Life Plan. Didn't start out to be that way, but I was inspired to start it with the name Eternal Life Plan. We never stop living. And matter of fact, <laughs> we live more abundantly on the other side and more joyfully and more loving. And the whole purpose of us being here is not to be fighting each other, but to loving each other and to cooperate with each other and to help each other and to be like more like God, to be loving like Jesus. And I'm still on that journey. Before the near-death experience, I feared dying with mortal sin on my soul. That's what I feared. I didn't think about dying much. And even when I went into the emergency C-section, it, you know, it didn't cross my mind that I was going to die. I mean, this is an operation that happens, you know, all over the world, all the time, all day long. So this wasn't a new procedure. This was an old standard procedure of delivering babies. So I didn't really think about um, death much. I was 37. I didn't think about death much. But it did bother me that I was outside of the Catholic Church and I was living outside of the Catholic Church. And that did bother me. I do not have any fear of death now. After experiencing the near-death experience, you know, even through the years raising my son, I've never feared death once. Matter of fact, I look forward to it when it's my time. But the beauty of God is, you know, he gave me a choice. He still gave me free will on the other side. I had the free will to stay or go back. So that's the one of the graces of God. I made the choice because I could not leave my son behind. I couldn't, you know, let him be raised by, I don't know who would have raised him. 
His dad certainly wouldn't have. So I came back to raise him. I came back for him. That He's the only reason why I came back. I don't know what would have happened to him. It wasn't like I was in a loving relationship and I knew the dad, you know, his father would take care of him. I knew his father wouldn't take care of him. So I was afraid of what was going to happen to him. And that's why I came back. I haven't talked a whole lot about it. I mean, he knows about it. I've asked, you know, I've shared it with him. He was much more concerned about the abortions because he said to me, you mean I didn't have to grow up alone? I could have had, you know, brothers and sisters. So that bothered him much more than the near-death experience. I've been asked before, did he have any near-death experience that he remembers when he died and he does not. So it was just me. I told my parents about it and they didn't say much, just, you know, kind of thought I was, oh, here she goes. When my dad died, he had a beautiful death and he was coherent all the way till the end. And I asked him if he was afraid to die. And he shook his head no. And I said, Dad, you know, I told you my near-death experience a long time ago. He goes, it's beautiful on the other side, Dad. It's absolutely beautiful on the other side. And I asked him if there were any angels in the room. And he raised his hand up, five. And I said, there's five angels here. And he shook his head, yes. And he said, beautiful, Christine, beautiful. And he died in 2013 beautiful death. He was a good man. But explaining the few times that I did about my near-death experience to people I was close to, you know, back in the 90s, no one really talked about it. Nobody really accepted it. I talked to a priest about it, and he told me it was probably just my imagination, which wasn't helpful. And so as I got older, I just felt by the Holy Spirit to just, you know, go back to revisiting the near-death experience and share with people, you know, how beautiful heaven is and not to be, well, I shouldn't say heaven. I don't, I don't think I was in heaven, but I certainly can share the beauty of God and what he feels like and what the other side feels like. But up until recently, I want to say in the last two years, most people that I share my near-death experience with didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to accept it. So that's the tragedy with near-death experiencers. <laughs> As the years went on, when I would try to reconnect to that feeling, it's dissipated over the years. It's, you know, gotten less and less. However, you know, my intuition was much more prominent. I can, you know, feel and know when God is speaking to me. I have constantly talking to my guardian angel all day long. I'm constantly talking to God, not just praying to God, but I mean talking to him like, you know, he's right here in the room with me because he is as a person. So my I shifted my relationship from being more religious to be more personal and being more, I have a big devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I have a big devotion to the Holy Souls in Purgatory. I have a big devotion to Jesus. So I talk to them like I would talk to a friend or like I would talk to a best friend. So I share everything with them all through the day, every day. I ask for their help. I ask for their guidance. Even with business decisions, I'll talk over a business decision and just get feedback from them. I think that's well said. It's more of a relationship building and prayer is more of an ask. Or if I'm praying for the intentions of someone, if someone is sick, I'll say certain prayers. Catholic Church is in a complete mess these days. So I'm on uh, devotional uh, prayer groups praying for the Catholic Church. So different things like that. But, you know, that's collectively praying. 
and then I individually pray as well. I have, you know, an hour in the morning and an hour at night that all I do is pray. And then all through the day, I'm just constantly checking in. And I'll just, you know, I live alone now. Um, my son is 31 years old and doing well and has his first child with his wife, a little boy. So it's easy for me to walk around my house talking to myself, to God and to Jesus and the Blessed Mary and getting there and listening for their answers. And I work, you know, I'm a sales coach and trainer. That's my real job. And I work out of my home and I have for the last 10 years, that's my business. And I work in total silence because you cannot hear God with all this noise going on in the background with music on or the TV on. So I work pretty much 12 hour days in total silence so I can hear how God is directing me. And, you know, God doesn't, he didn't tell us what to do. He shows us choices because he gives us free will. And he isn't going to do that if we don't ask him to. So the key is you've got to ask for God's help. You've got to ask for your guardian angel's help. You've got to ask for Jesus' help. And then be quiet and listen in to what they're saying to you. My near-death experience story is an extravagant or elaborate like some are. I call it a simple near-death experience. I don't know if there's different degrees or not, but it was a pretty simple experience since I've listened to some other people's near-death experience, but I can't underplay enough or I can't explain enough the incredible feeling it is when you're on the other side in God's presence. It's a love that is so intense, a love that you cannot imagine on this plane what it's like because it's undescribable. I mean, think about it. Here I was living a life away from God, living a life not even thinking about God, living a life that I, you know, I did whatever I wanted. And yet, he had the mercy to save me. I know some people don't believe in hell, but I do. I do. It's not because I saw it. I felt it. That fear and terror was hell. And I do believe that people have a choice to go to heaven or to hell. Some people that are so hardened by life, and there's all kinds of stories especially that are Catholic stories of these women and men that were tormented by Satan. And even up until when they died, actually Sandra Abrahams talks about this in her near-death experience. She felt something pull her down, was pulling her down after she died. And then she saw, then she felt something she grabbed onto something to pull her up. And that's when she saw the white light and moved forward to the white light. So, you know, I'm one of these that believe that there's heaven, hell, and purgatory. And we can reject God. And when you reject God, he gives you the free will to reject him, even during death. And if you reject him, you go to hell. So... Heaven is real. Don't be afraid of death. Do not be afraid of death. Don't turn away from God. Don't be afraid of death. Because the other side is a beautiful, amazing, and loving world where you will have no physical pain at all, no emotional pain. It's just beauty.